Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sony FE 24mm f 2.8G, a compact wide angle prime lens for their full frame mirrorless cameras. Announced in March 2021, it costs $599, and there's links to the latest US and UK pricing in the description. 24mm is actually one of my favourite focal lengths, striking a very usable balance between 28mm and ultra wide models. The 4mm difference from 28 doesn't sound too much, but actually captures a comfortably broader field of view with a more dynamic perspective while also avoiding the distortion and extreme effects of ultra wide angle lenses. It's perfect for expansive landscapes, tight interiors, and even some environmental portraiture, including handheld vlogging, and in this review, I'll show you how it performs in practice. The 24 2.8 was launched alongside a 40mm 2.5 and 50mm 2.5 as part of a compact triplet. All three share the same external styling and dimensions, not to mention the same $599 price, and I've made reviews of all three, which is your favourite? Personally, I'm pleased Sony's finally got round to making some more small lenses. After all, the full frame alpha mirrorless system was launched alongside a compact 55 1.8 and 35 2.8 that demonstrated the potential for portability. But then Sony's focus turned to high performing but inevitably larger lenses. Now, don't get me wrong, I do love the quality of the G Master series and I also appreciate that some are small and light for their class. But I also feel that Sony's compact bodies deserve more small options for times when portability or discretion are more important. Third party certainly spotted an opportunity and ran with it, most notably Sigma which now has four compact primes available in the E-mount as part of its contemporary I series. Here's the Sigma 24, 35 and 45 models with a 65 completing the set so far and coincidentally the first three models pictured here all cost roughly the same as the new Sony's. As a recent lens the Sigma 24 3.5 is the perfect rival to the new Sony so let's see how they directly compare against each other. Let's start with coverage and to put 24mm into perspective I'm going to start with the view when shooting with the Sony 50mm f2.5G followed by the slightly wider 40mm f2.5G. Now both of these are considered as delivering standard coverage. Now for the Sony 24mm f2.8G showing how much wider the view is from the same position. And finally switching to the Sigma 24 3.5 which as you can see is capturing a slightly smaller field of view. Whether the Sigma is slightly longer than 24 or the Sony is slightly wider than 24, I'm not sure, but there is a very minor difference between them. All of these images are JPEGs taken with a Sony Alpha 1 using the default compensation settings. As I'll show you later, the Sony 24 2.8 is actually capturing an even wider field of view when shooting in RAW before cropping it slightly to correct for geometry, but the end result remains a little wider than the Sigma. At 68 by 45 mil and weighing 162 grams, the Sony 24 2.8 on the left can't quite be described as a pancake lens, but it remains very compact and light. In comparison, Sigma's 24 3.5 on the right is a little narrower, a little longer, and a little heavier too at 230 grams. But once they're both mounted on a body, you won't notice much difference in size and weight. I have them here on an Alpha 1. They do have quite different designs and controls though. The Sony 24 2.8 has a tactile but very narrow aperture ring with a smooth focusing ring positioned right alongside it. Impressively, Sony's also managed to squeeze in a small customizable focus hold button, as well as the chance to declick the aperture ring with a switch, features both missing from the Sigma, not to mention most small lenses. The filter thread on the Sony measures 49 millimeters. Meanwhile, the Sigma 24 3.5 positions its aperture ring further back with wider knurling on either side of the F numbers. The manual focusing ring is similarly damped to the Sony lens, but again the Sigma lacks the focus hold button and declickable options. It's less featured, but I feel the design is less cramped and has an attractive vintage look to it. The Sigma takes larger 55mm filters. Both lenses are described as being dust and splash proof with subtle rubber grommets at their mounts, although Sigma ceiling doesn't extend to the whole barrel. Both lenses are supplied with quite different hoods. The Sony 24 2.8 on the left comes with a short cylindrical hood, which as an aside is the main design difference with the inward sloping hoods supplied with the 40 and 50 versions. Meanwhile, Sigma supplies a more substantial petal hood that will obviously occupy more space in a bag, but provides greater protection. I also quite like the ribbed styling on the Sigma hoods that ties in with the vintage look of the lens. What do you think? Okay, now for a focusing comparison, starting with the Sony 24 2.8 at f2.8 on an Alpha 1 using a single AF area to refocus between the bottles while filming video. Here the performance is smooth, quiet and confident as you'd expect, and from close range some blurring is possible even at wide focal lengths. 
Switching to the Sigma 24 3.5 again on the Alpha 1 at the maximum aperture and you'll see it's equally capable at focusing for video. Note when using single AFS mode for stills photography, I found Sigma lenses on Sony bodies often use a contrast based wobble to confirm focus, but once the body is set to continuous AFC, they settle on the target in one motion. Next for a video test with the Sony 24 2.8 on the Alpha 1 with wide area and continuous AFC. With human eye detection enabled, the camera drives the lens very confidently. The 24mm focal length may not be your first choice for portraiture, it's a bit too wide right, but if the subject's positioned carefully on the frame it can work quite well for environmental compositions where you need to see more of the surroundings, plus it's an ideal focal length for handheld vlogging. For comparison here's the Sigma 24 3.5 again with the same settings as before where again in continuous AFC mode it's doing an equally good job at keeping me in sharp focus as I move around the frame. Meanwhile, can you see much difference between the f2.8 aperture of the Sony and the 3.5 of the Sigma yet? Let's take a closer look in a stills portrait comparison. I'm starting with the Sony 24 2.8 with its aperture wide open where it's possible to achieve a small amount of blurring in the background. Taking a closer look at the Sony portrait shows pin sharp details on my eyeball as driven by the Alpha 1's eye detection and across multiple portrait tests every single eye was equally sharp. Overall, the lens proved to be very sharp on subject details, even when coupled with an unforgivably high resolution body. Moving sideways for a look at the rendering shows a little blurring, although for greater subject separation you'll understandably need faster and or longer lenses. Like the 40 and 50mm versions launched alongside it, I'd say the edges of blurred shapes on the 24 is a little better defined than I'd personally like, resulting in a busier background than lenses with softer rendering styles. If you really want to see what a top end lens at this focal length can do, check out the Sony 24mm f1.4 G Master, but that's a bigger lens that costs twice as much. Now back to the full image from the Sony before switching to the Sigma 24 3.5, shot from the same position where again you'll notice the slightly tighter field of view. Here's a close look with the Sony on the left and the Sigma on the right, where you can see both are capable of capturing very fine details, although the Sony is arguably a fraction sharper here, perhaps due to nailing the focus on my eye a little more accurately. In my tests I found the Sony lenses delivered 100% hit rate with face and eye detection, whereas the Sigma lenses were a little lower, at least when using eye detection on the Alpha 1. That said, I still managed to get plenty of focus portraits with the Sigmas, just not every single one of them. Comparing their rendering style in the background though tells an interesting story. Looking closely at the slightly faster f2.8 aperture on the Sony is indeed delivering slightly larger blurred shapes than the 3.5 of the Sigma, but compare their edges and you'll notice the Sigma's rendering is much smoother with more gradual transitions compared to the sharper edges of Sony's bokeh blobs. Now it's a personal choice, but I prefer the look of Sigma's rendering here even though its aperture is actually a tad slower. Next for the rendering of bokeh balls from close range, starting with the Sony 24 2.8 near to its closest focusing distance and working between the maximum aperture of f2.8 up to f8. From this distance it's possible to generate small bokeh balls, but in the same way as the 40 and 50mm versions there's visible outlining around their edges, albeit less obvious patterns within. With the lens close to f4 or smaller the 7 bladed diaphragm system also becomes visible with the blobs taking on the 7 sided geometric shape. Here's the Sony 24 2.8 on the left and the Sigma 24 3.5 on the right, both at their maximum apertures and from the same distance. As seen on previous comparisons, the Sigma captures a slightly tighter field of view which in turn compensates for the slightly slower aperture to deliver similarly sized blobs in this test. Their rendering style is fairly similar here too, although while the Sigma is not immune to outlining and patterned interiors, I'd still say that its rendering is a little bit smoother than the Sony here. In terms of minimum focusing distances, Sony quotes 24cm with autofocus or 18cm in manual, and here's what I could achieve when manually focusing, reproducing a subject size of just over 17cm across the frame, and even with the aperture wide open the details are pretty sharp right up to the edges. Now here's the Sony 24 at the top and the Sigma 24 at the bottom, both from their closest manually focused distances and at their maximum apertures. The Sigma at the bottom can focus much closer to just 10.8cm, that's almost twice as close as the Sony, and it allows it to deliver much greater magnification, reproducing 6.5cm across the frame. But from this distance it quickly becomes soft away from the centre, so it's best suited to subjects in the very middle with dreamy looking surroundings, at least from that distance. That said, if you close down the Sigma or shoot from a little further away, it can become sharper towards the edges, but still not as crisp as the Sony is out of the gate. 
At the other end of the scale, here's my distant landscape scene, starting with the Sony 24 2.8 on the Alpha 1 at f2.8, and with the view angled so that details run right into the corners. I'm focused on the middle of the view here. Zooming in on this middle section reveals perfectly crisp details in the maximum aperture, with no benefit to closing it down to improve the quality further. Moving out to the far corner proves the lens can maintain the detail again with the aperture wide open, and it's a pretty flat feel because I'm still focused on the middle of the frame. There's unsurprisingly some vignetting or darkening in the corners at f2.8, but this reduces as you gradually close the aperture. Overall though, like the 40 and 50 versions, I'm very satisfied by the 24's performance wide open. Toggling between uncorrected RAW files and the in-camera JPEG versions reveals the latter are benefiting from both geometric correction and compensation for vignetting. Compare that to toggling between RAW and JPEG versions shot with the Sigma 24 3.5 and you'll see there's no geometric corrections applied by default, although applying it from the lens menu the Alpha 1 did improve some barrel distortion. With the Sony 24 2.8 on the left and the Sigma 24 3.5 on the right, showing magnified views of their central areas, you'll see both perform very well at their respective maximum apertures, although again the Sigma's view is a little tighter. Switching to their corners, and again that difference in coverage means we're looking at different details, but from the same part of the frame. Both are a little bit softer in the corners compared to their central areas, and there's darkening due to vignetting too, but overall their performance for distant subjects is fairly similar here, and once stopped down a little, are essentially neck and neck. Just before wrapping up, a few video tests for you. I enjoy filming at 24mm for the same reasons as shooting photos at 24mm. The ability to capture a satisfyingly wide field of view, while also being more forgiving to handheld shooting. As seen earlier, it can work well for people, as long as they don't get too close, and as long as they also avoid the edges where distortion can become unflattering. Great though, if you want to see more of your surroundings. This is why it's also an ideal focal length for handheld vlogging, although if you intend to apply stronger digital stabilisation which incurs a crop, you may begin to find it not quite wide enough. So if you intend to use active steady shot or post stabilisation in Catalyst, I'd suggest the Sony 20mm 1.8 or perhaps the Samyang 18mm 2.8 instead. And if you intend to crop a lot in post, even the Sigma 60mm 1.4 originally designed for APS-C sensors could actually become an option. And finally, a focus breathing test starting with the Sony 24 2.8, manually focusing from infinity to the closest distance and back again at f22. As you focus this lens closer, the field of view actually increases, which is opposite to the effect seen on the 40 and 50mm versions, which gradually tighten their views as you focus closer. Either way, breathing is quite apparent on all three of the new Sony Compact Primes, although it's also present on some of their high-end models too. And for comparison, here's the Sigma 24 3.5, manually focusing between infinity and the closest distance again at f22. Again, there's visible breathing, but this time in the opposite direction, so it's reducing the field of view as you focus closer. Now it's time for my final verdict, and as I wrap up my review of the lens, I'll show you a bunch of images I shot with it on the Alpha 1. As always, you can access the original images for closer inspection via my review of the lens at Camerolabs.com. The Sony FE 24mm f2.8G is an attractive mid-priced prime lens for anyone who enjoys wide-angle photography. The quality is sharp across the frame even at large apertures, the focusing quick and quiet, and the lens well featured with weather sealing, a focus hold button, and a declickable aperture ring. Best of all, you're getting a decent degree of performance in a very compact and lightweight lens, making for a very portable combination with Sony's smaller bodies. Meanwhile, APS-C owners will enjoy milder but still useful 36mm equivalent coverage. Like the 40 and 50 versions launched alongside it, my only complaints are sharper edged and busier rendering than I'd like, personally speaking, along with quite noticeable focus breathing, although the latter will only annoy some videographers, and it's also present on some of Sony's high-end lenses too. Regarding the rendering, I personally preferred the slightly softer style from Sigma's DGDN lenses, but at this price, you're never going to get the smooth and outline-free bokeh of higher-end lenses. So if you want the most attractive rendering at the 24mm focal length, I'd recommend Sony's 24mm 1.4 G Master, but that's a larger lens and one that's double the price. Alternatively, APS-C owners have the old but still excellent 24mm 1.8 ZA, that's that Zeiss collaboration, with lovely rendering and very useful close focusing, but again at a higher price, and of course without full frame correction. As a side note, I actually use that lens on a Sony A6400 body for most of my product B-roll. Overall, the Sony 24 2.8G is a solid choice for wide-angle photographers who value portability over the shallowest depth of field effects or smoothest rendering. 
It plays to its strengths, delivering sharp results even on the highest resolution bodies and fast, reliable autofocus. Most of all, I'm delighted Sony's made some new small lenses and hope more in the pipeline. The E-mount catalogue now has something for everyone. Right, that's it for this review. As always, if you found any of it useful, you can reward me with a like and a follow. It only takes a moment to click that button, but it really helps this channel grow, so I'd greatly appreciate you doing it. If you're feeling extra generous, you could treat me to a coffee, or treat yourself to my in-camera photography book, or how about a nice Camera Labs t-shirt? And there's links to everything, including the latest prices below. Oh, and if you're interested in the 40 or 50 f2.5 models, I've got reviews of those too. So let me know which is your favorite model Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.